A quote from the great Nelson Shanks. Nature is the best and really the only vocabulary that an artist can legitimately work with. My name is Yupari and I'd like to welcome you to this week's video. For the mediums today, to the left of my cup here, I just have regular odorless mineral spirits, and to the right, I'm trying something different this week. I'm using a walnut oil medium. So it's just walnut oil, and it has kind of the consistency of the medium that I was using in previous videos. If you've seen my previous videos, I had a different mixture. Um, so here it is. The walnut oil. I'm not being paid to advertise any particular brand. This was just the cheapest walnut oil that I could find in the art store, so I just got it and used it. And I'll show you in some clips throughout the footage of how I use it. I use it pretty much the same. I clean off my brushes and then I dip it into the medium and then that's it. That's all I do with the medium. And it is a slow dryer as well, so it also allows me to work for longer periods of time. And here's our model for today, my grandmother Victoria, and I'm going to keep an image of her to the top left corner of the screen so you can refer to it as I develop the painting. I'm going to read out my palette to you starting from the top left corner. So I have titanium white, lead white, raw umber, alizarin crimson, cadmium red, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, sap green, cobalt teal, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. And if you'd like to know more about the brands of paint that I'm using, the particular panel that I'm painting on, and the types of brushes that I'm using, I'm going to type up that information in the description below along with the walnut oil that I introduced in the beginning. So I'll just look at the bottom of the video and you'll see uh, typed up all of the information on the materials that I'm using today. So I'm starting off with a size 2 filbert brush, a filbert bristle brush, and I like to use these bristle brushes because they can hold a great deal of paint and make marks similar to that of a uh, stick of vine charcoal. Uh, I like to draw with vine charcoal whenever I'm drawing, so uh, this has the same kind of handling as the vine charcoal. And so I'm using raw umber diluted with a tad bit of my mineral spirits, and I mean a very small amount of my mineral spirits just to get the paint to run a little bit. And what I'm trying to do is establish my placement onto the panel. And if you notice the placement shifted, I moved the head up a little bit higher than my initial statement. So it's important for me to, in the beginning, to remain as loose as possible and work with straight lines and angles and keep myself constantly moving around the surface, especially in the beginning with a portrait painting, especially when you're painting somebody uh, very close to you. Like for me, I'm painting my grandmother. I'm very much trying to be as abstract as possible to simplify the forms that I'm seeing in front of me into a digestible set of simple shapes. And the key word here is the simple shapes. Notice that I don't really have too much information onto the actual outline of the model's head or anything like that. I just have a basic shape placing the head onto the surface. And I think it's important to have some type of working architecture, something that is very simple for you to understand so that you can start off almost every portrait in this kind of way where you're just gathering information. Notice that line I just put in the, the middle is my center line. And it's going to indicate to me the turn of the model's head in relation to me. So the model is pretty much in a three-quarter view but a three-quarter view that is closer to profile. And profile view is to view completely from the side when you're not really seeing the other side of the model's face. So it's three-quarter view, a little bit closer to profile. And now I'm going to go in and roughly sketch in the axes of where the features are going to fit. So I have just one simple large rectangular shape encompassing the axes of the eyes and the nose and the mouth. So I, I'm really just trying to work in a way that I can 
build more complicated structures on top of and I'm very much just trying to gather as much information as I possibly can in a very minimalistic way. So the idea here is that to develop this painting I don't want to do too much of a linear drawing. Now sometimes I draw much more with my uh, burnt umber or my raw umber drawing colors. Oftentimes I will draw more information in the start or I will draw less. But in this case I'm drawing a little bit less. I just have a very simple mass now that I drew in for the shadow side of the face. Now at this stage of the painting this could be anybody. That is anybody with that kind of hair and turned to that kind of degree away from me. And that's the, the idea right now is that I want to start off with something that could be anybody. It could be any kind of uh, person that is turned to the side for me with that particular uh, setup of hair and whatever. It is anyone. And now the idea is to build more complicated shapes and then to pull focus into what exactly we're looking at. So we're very much working from general to specific and that's pretty much all I will do for the raw umber linear block-in. Now I'm going to start working with large masses of paint. I'm going to be switching to my synthetic brushes. So this is a Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle and I'll write exactly what brush that is in the description below. But in any case, notice the black tape on my brush and I actually do that so I can separate my brushes based on different areas of the painting. So this brush is designated to the darkest of the darks. So I'm going to use it to lightly mass in a large shape now for the dark mass of the hair. And remember the word mass just means a large area of color and value. That's what that is, that blob that I'm painting there. That blob is a large mass. And I'm trying to use as little medium as I possibly can. And I actually use just a little bit of the uh, the walnut oil on the brush before I applied the brush to the paint. So that walnut oil is very similar to the stand oil and mineral spirits mixture that I had in my previous videos. It handles almost the same and it's, I can almost not really differentiate it. I'd say the walnut oil is perhaps a little bit thicker than the mixture that I had. Remember the stand oil that I was using before I actually diluted with mineral spirits so it was fairly thin because remember stand oil on its own is extremely thick so that's why I diluted it but in any case the walnut oil is a very nice consistency to spread a tone on the surface uh, like I did with that dark mass. Now notice I switched brushes now to a it is a Jack Richardson Gray Matters brush I believe uh, but in any case, I will type that information in the description. So now I'm working side by side. So I painted the dark mass of the hair. And now I'm going to be painting in the dark mass of the shadow. And I like to work with large masses in this way side by side. So that I can compare each shape and each value in relation to one another directly by painting them right next to each other onto the surface and I painted them right next to each other on the palette. Notice on the palette that the two masses of color are right next to each other. And I'm also starting off with the darkest masses that are going to exist on the painting. And I do that uh, because it's easier to see an image if it's simplified into just large areas of light and dark. I'm very much concerned with the big picture. I'm really thinking about the large masses of color and large masses of value before I get hung up too much on any kind of little small details. And in fact working in this way 
Uh, I consider it as drawing with paint or drawing with large masses. You can draw like this with a soft vine charcoal. So a little piece of soft vine charcoal or even medium vine charcoal on a pastel paper is a great way to practice drawing with these large masses. And so it does take a great deal of trust in your linear drawing ability. We're kind of working from the inside out in this kind of fashion. Working from the inner large masses and then working our way out to the more specific outlines. Now notice I switched brushes again. So this is going to be my designated background brush. And it's not always the case where I use each brush for exactly what it needs to be used for. I do mix up my brushes quite a bit. Uh, so that's usually, I usually try to separate brushes for different tasks such as the uh, this brush here for the background and then as you saw before the brush for the shadow on the side of the face and the dark of the hair. But in any case I'm using a dark green mixture for the background. Now I know you've seen me use dark green plenty of times before and I like to use cooler colors in the background if I'm gonna go warmer in the foreground or if I'm gonna go warmer with the flesh tones. In this case I'm gonna be painting in the red of the, or sorry, the dark red of the uh, the cover that the model is wearing. So that's a pretty dark red contrast. So I'm gonna start off with this dark green to contrast with that. So I'm very much already planning out the large composition of the picture. And the brush is diluted with the walnut oil, just the walnut oil and the paint. And I'm using that to spread a tone on the background. I'm painting it a little bit thinner than it will be in the future layers and that's because I've noticed with these panels that I work on and even on cotton canvas especially linen canvas as well. Uh, the paint, especially in the dark areas like this one right here, starts to settle. And it starts to settle after maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And so that's why I put in the initial mass that's a little bit thinner and then it settles in in maybe 20 or 30 minutes or so and then I go back in and then I can make the value that much deeper. So that's a recent development. Uh, that I've learned through all these paintings is that the darks tend to settle. And that big brush right there is my fan brush. And you'll see me use that plenty of times to try to eliminate glare. Here's how I use the walnut oil. I just dip a clean brush right into the walnut oil or I clean off a brush then dip it into the walnut oil and it helps me create this consistency. So it is not completely grainy uh, if I were to use just the paint itself, it'd be kind of sticky. So that medium gives me a nice consistency. Now I know uh, ideally you just want to work with just paint and no medium. I've been told that several times. And I think that's a good idea, but I like to dilute it a little bit at first. And then as the painting develops, I end up using less and less of the medium. Now, if you've seen my previous videos, even from the very early on videos, sometimes I would call this a false color, where I cover the entire surface of the light side of the face with one flat color. Other times I've worked from the top of the forehead and rendered everything out as much as I could and then worked my way down. Other times I've worked kind of in the middle where I put in smaller shapes and then try to build them. In this case, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be working with the large masses of value in the light side, but I'm going to be painting a little bit plane by plane. So those brush strokes that I just placed in are intended to be separating larger planes on the head. Even though the values aren't where they need to be, those brush strokes are telling me there's a plane on the forehead, there's a plane on the bottom of the eye socket. Let me differentiate the two planes and then build from there. 
So that's the thought process going on in my head. And notice now I'm actually using more of the lead white than I am of the titanium white. And that is because I'm trying to work with more paint. Uh, recently, I've been trying to work with more paint than I had before. And that was only after trying to do a Rembrandt master copy. And I did that video last week. And I used a ton of the lead white. And um, the, red, the lead white is pretty expensive. It's by this brand uh, named Rublev. And again, I will type that in the description below. Uh, but in any case, if you don't want to use the lead white, uh, Gamblin actually has a flake white replacement, which is what I was using before, which is supposed to replace flake white. And flake white is uh, known as another uh, lead white. But Rublev makes this lead white that is much thinner, I feel, and it can hold much more of the actual intensity of the color as I add more and more paint. And so it helps me with that. And then another one you can use if you don't want to use the lead white is zinc white. Zinc white is another thin white, but I have been told uh, that it does kind of lead to some cracking, and I don't really know if that's the case. I, I don't have enough information to tell you if it does lead to cracking or it, if it does not. So I'm sorry if I didn't respond about that. In any case, the lead white is a transparent white. And a transparent white is uh, pretty useful for flesh tones because it allows you to use more of your paint because you are not sacrificing the intensity of the color by adding the white. Uh, if you've seen a, a lot of artist palettes, they tend to add much more white than the other colors. And even before, I used to put like four or five dots of the whites on my palette, and now I only have two. But I assure you, I keep adding more and more of the whites. The only reason I have two dots of white instead of four dots of the same white, it's just because I don't have enough room on this palette. But in any case, using that mixture with the, uh, the thin white with the pigment, the artist grade pigment, I should uh, reiterate that I'm, it's kind of important for me to use this artist grade pigment, really helps me get more of a rich, uh, deep color. And at this stage of the painting, I'm pretty much painting plane by plane. Each little brush stroke that you see there on the surface is really just trying to uh, differentiate between one surface of the structure and another surface of the structure. I'm not trying to uh, perfectly nail exactly what I'm looking at at the moment. I'm very much still trying to gather information as I develop the painting and going in cadmium red, cadmium yellow onto the mixture that I already had on the top of the palette. Now when I said that I'm not trying to capture exactly what I'm looking at right away, it's because I'm trying to look beneath the surface. I'm trying to find uh, the underlying large planes and the idea the thought process behind that is that if I can find other large and simple planes and large and simple masses of value and color, that even though it may look a little frightening without any indications of the features, the nostrils, the eyelashes, or even the mouth, that I have something down that is going to enable me to develop a more refined image on top of and all the while working on a layer of paint that is still wet and that is still flexible and malleable. And the challenge in painting like this really is to let go of the idea of trying to make the painting look like the model right away. And I know that that's kind of a very difficult thing to keep in mind uh, is that we're but we're going to hold back on trying to get the likeness of the model right away and instead try to work in this 
large planar and simplistic fashion in which we try to encompass the underlying structure of the model's head. And I know that it is possible to get a likeness without placing the features or the nostrils or anything like that. It is possible. Imagine you uh, take off your glasses. Imagine you're nearsighted. You take off your glasses and your friend is standing maybe five feet away from you. You don't see any of their features or their nostrils or their eyelashes, but you can still tell who they are. So it is possible to get a likeness without putting any kind of details, um, but that's not what I'm trying to get at right away. Uh, what I'm trying to do, to be honest, is to just get paint on the surface, and paint on the surface to communicate to me where each and every shape needs to go. And I'm not going to nail it perfectly first try. I'm not going to get the right color or the right value first try. I need to have something on the surface. It can be deceptive sometimes when we go to museums or we go to galleries and shows and we see all these wonderfully finished paintings. Or if we look at a painting that's so effortless yet so realistic like a John Singer Sargent, it can be very deceiving. Uh, because then we start to think, man, they really must have gotten the right brushstroke, the right color on each and every part of the face just right. And you can think about it somewhat like, like a movie. Like an actor, a, a well-trained actor, a well-rehearsed actor or actress can possibly make it look like you're experiencing what it is that they are experiencing or what it is that they are trying to make you feel like they are experiencing. The well-trained actor or the well-trained actress can very easily make you think that it all happened first try, first times, and that is not the case. There are many outtakes, there are many attempts, there are many crashes, many failures that go into that and then in the end you get the picture you get the the motion picture you get the experience of your favorite TV show your favorite movie and it seems so effortless and it seems so impossible to try to recreate but I assure you that they did have to go through a lot. They did have to practice. They did have to work. They did have to put in the effort that it takes to make that one little segment, even a two minute segment of a movie or a 10 second segment of a movie look effortless. And in painting, you can see what I'm doing is I'm trying to create the underlying structure of the picture, but at this stage, if I were to leave the painting at this stage, you would think twice about watching my videos. You would think, uh, that's hideous. What am I doing watching this? Why am I spending my time watching this person paint this? And I'm trying to give you the reality of what it is like to be a portrait artist and try to capture the likeness and the image of a person and trying to hold back on the finishing details, the finishing touches and establish your large planes on the picture. Yeah, some of them are wrong. Some of them are clearly wrong, uh, such as the side plane of the model's face. It's not even there yet. It's still the tone of the surface. So I still haven't quite gotten my shapes to where I want them to be, but I'm starting off with something, like the actor or the actress, starting off with something. Notice I just filled in that little empty place of color and value. I'm starting off with something so that I can mold the rest of the shapes into a more workable and a more humanistic shape. Going into my lead white now onto the top values on my palette. Notice how I have the top values on the palette 
a little bit higher and then as it rolls down the palette they get progressively darker so it, it helps me to keep a little value scale set up on the side of my painting on my palette so that I can refer to the values on the palette in relation to one another before placing them down onto the portrait. It doesn't always work out that way. I don't always have the uh, value scale like this in this fashion. Sometimes I just mix anywhere I want, uh, but other times it's kind of it's kind of nice to have this simple arrangement of values on my palette as I create the painting. And sometimes it's gotten to the point where it's kind of intuitive now. I've done it so many times trying to mix up that generic scale of basic flesh tones. If you remember, if you've seen my older videos, I would actually pre-mix those before painting them onto the surface. And that was because I was really new to that. I was really trying to uh, teach myself that discipline of keeping the uh, value scale of flesh tones on my palette. That was very new to me at that point, but now I've done so many paintings where I maintain that value scale that it's almost automatic that I mix these colors in their value relations on the palette. And that also has something to do with the number of paintings that you create or the amount of practice, or the amount of hours that you put into painting. At first, some things may be very difficult, a very big struggle, especially trying to work in this way, where it looks like we have created an abstract monster onto the surface. And it very much looks that way to the untrained eye, that it looks like I'm creating a big monster. But the reality is that I'm trying to capture the most simple shapes that I can to mold the structure into a more humanistic like image. But in any case, with the number of paintings that you create, with the amount of practice, the amount of hours that you put in to your craft, there are things that will become automatic and seemingly intuitive to you. So that will be enough with the large Plain. So now I'm going to clean off these brushes. Here's how I clean off my brushes actually. Just dip them all at once into the mineral spirits and then just uh, repeat this process several times till they're clean. And now we're going to switch into the smaller brushes. And with the smaller brushes I'm then going to add the complexity onto the surface. I'm going to add the information that will make that big blob that I created much and more of a humanistic looking structure. For the placement of the eyes, I usually start with an indication for where the two tear ducts are going to be in relation to one another using two little dots of a lizard crimson and raw umber. And with a horizontal line, as you saw me make with a brush, I then try to gauge the exact placement of one dot relative to another dot, and that's how simple it can begin. Just one dot relative to another dot. Remember, a line is a pathway between two points, and based on where that line is relative to a horizontal axis, then we have an angle, and an angle hopefully that is specific to that of the angle of which the model's eyes are resting in relation to one another. And in this case, all it means is that the eye to the left of your screen is just a little bit higher than the eye to the right of your screen. And now I'm going to use a vertical line to relate that one point of the tear duct to the left of your screen to the corner of the nose. So using those two points, I can now relate another point to where the nose goes. And this is also referred to as triangularization, I believe. It's also kind of intuitive if you think about it. Two points in space, just picture empty space, two points in space can be any distance away from one another. It only, well, measuring only happens when you place a third point and with that third point then you can relate where exactly 
each point is in relation to one another. And those three points are what I used for the two tear ducts and to the corner of the nose, the corner to the left of the screen. And now I'm going to go in and add the darks for each iris. And notice how simple I'm trying to maintain the eyes at this stage. Very much just using raw umber and a little bit of ultramarine blue to draw out the eyes. Now I'm sorry that there is not a view of my palette as I create these smaller shapes, so I will explain my color choices to you as I create them. And so for the darks, it's primarily ultramarine blue and raw umber. And that is because I am drawing on the smaller shapes as I go. And the raw umber and ultramarine blue is a nice kind of middle dark color. So it's a dark in value, but kind of middle color where it's not a very intrusive color. It's not bright red, it's not bright blue, it's not quite ivory black. So it's a nice mixture to have. So now I placed in my first color choice and that was for the half tone of the corner of the eyelid to the right of your screen. And now I'm placing in a light for the high lit region of the eye socket. Now the warm color mixture was, I assure you, just a alizarin crimson onto the middle range of the palette. So it's a neutral alizarin crimson. And now I'm adding in that same color to the top of the high lit region of the eye socket. And now I'm going to be building the structure of the eye socket and the nose plane by plane, just like I did with the large structure of the head. I'm painting plane by plane. Each individual area now where I'm applying the brush strokes is indicating to me where a plane exists in space. And like I did in the beginning, I'm not trying to perfectly nail exactly where each plane needs to go. Rather, I'm trying to work with large masses of value and color. And that also takes uh, quite a bit of patience as well because we really want to go in there. Intuitively, we really want to go in there and draw out the curvature of the nostril or we want to go in there and draw out the shape of the eyelashes and all that. And so after placing these dark shapes for the nose, notice that dark shape is a very neutral in color. It's almost not even a color. It's still the ultramarine blue and raw umber like mixture. But then I added a little bit of a laser and crimson to the mixture for the dark accent of the nostril, that dark value underneath the nostril. And now I'm putting in another half tone to the corner of the model's eye socket. And now when you're painting uh, someone that's a little bit older than than you are, or just painting someone that is a little bit more weathered, or however you would like to word it, whenever you're painting someone with more structure on their face, there is a great deal of form that is involved in the development of the picture. So let's go into the forms. So now, still painting plane by plane, I'm trying to create now a curvature from the corner of the eye to the, to the left corner of the eye relative to your screen to the right. And I have a dark light, a middle light, and a light light. And I'm following through now to the light on the white of the eye known as the sclera. Now the white of the eye is not white and so I'm using a mixture that is a little bit cooler so it's still raw umber and, and uh, titanium white actually with a little bit of ultramarine blue. Now the titanium white I'm using because I'm alright with the color going a little bit more on the gray kind of side. So with the sclera, the white of the eye it's uh, they're almost the same with each painting that I create 
and uh, that is kind of a controversial kind of thing to say where I paint something the exact same with each feature, but that is true for me with the sclera, the light of the eye, the white portion of the eye. I try to use pretty much just titanium white, raw umber, and a tad bit of some kind of blue on top of the flesh tones that I already had on the picture. And that is because I'm trying to avoid uh, colors such as red or pink, anything like that, onto the white of the eyes. That's something I would not want. And so now I'm going to go in and add even more shapes onto the eye to the right of the screen. Just a little dark placement now for the bottom portion of the upper eyelid. And now you can think of it as eyelashes. The darks exist there because of the eyelashes. Or you can think of it as because the form of the upper eyelid is wrapping around the surface creating that dark value and I like to think that way I'd like to think that it's because the structure is wrapping around the light and receiving less light that is why I placed that dark light and so that is the type of thinking that goes on into my head when I'm rendering forms in this kind of way I'm working first from general to specific but when I get specific I want to think about things as large structures subdividing into smaller structures. So even when I paint very small areas, and such as this highlight on the eye, I still think of the structural integrity of that form. This place on the eye right here with the highlight is the area on the eye that is receiving the most light. That is, it's most perpendicular to the ray of light. It's most perpendicular to the light source. And anything that is parallel with the light is, of course, in shadow. And that has a lot to do with the way that I develop form. I think of the angle of each individual plane with respect to the light source. And now I'm going to add just a little bit more light to the eye to the left of the screen. After placing the highlight, I noticed that that value was just too dark. So I'm now adding just a little more titanium white to that mixture I described earlier. I'm going to raise that value just a little bit higher up. And also think of the, the eyeball itself as a spherical object. So it does also... Uh, get a little bit darker as it curves away from the light. And now I'm going to go back in and repaint that uh, dark of the eye that I took out earlier. And so also painting is kind of a push and pull with your drawing or with your outlines. Sometimes you place something in there and then to only lose it and then find it again. That kind of lost and found uh, thing happens a lot in painting in this kind of way and it's just something that to me again through a repetition uh, I found that it's something that's become kind of intuitive to me where it wasn't maybe 30 videos ago is that push and pull where I find information and then I lose information and it's kind of you take two step forwards and one step back kind of thing and that's just the nature of painting paint on its own is very uh, it works very well in working with large masses that is it's very conducive to painting large shapes and then sculpting them out you can also work in other ways where you uh, do a finished line drawing then fill everything in uh, but that's not really how I like to paint. To me that seems more like a like a coloring book and I don't really like to think about it like a coloring book. I like to add large areas of paint onto other large areas of paint. It's just more fun for me. And so now I'm putting in uh, another dark light to the corner of the eye as we start to add more and more specificity onto the surface of the eye socket. Notice that this dark light is now curving out of the light. So we're curving out of the dark light and then 
slowly turning our way towards the lighter planes. And this area right here is darker, it's probably the darkest area of the side of the eye, perhaps even in shadow, just a glimpse of shadow. And now we're going to follow through to the other side of the eye socket. And that area is very much concave and it's receiving almost no light but still receiving a little bit of light and now we're wrapping our way around to the corner of the the side plane of the eye socket this little area right here is actually receiving more light as well so it's the planes on this area are facing the light more and more in relation to the surrounding planes and so now I'm painting in a little halfway plane that plane is kind of merging those two sections together. Now I'm going to do the same with the corner of the eye and I'm still trying to think of it as structures but I'm also kind of thinking of it as a puzzle. I'm not thinking of it too much like this is an eye. I'm painting an eye now. Rather I'm thinking of it as a puzzle and each piece has to fit in relation to each surrounding piece. Notice there's a little pathway of light right here. You can think of it as a little bridge between one plane and another plane. And that way I'm also abstracting what it is that I'm looking at. Thinking of that as a bridge from one surface to another surface. Thinking of each area abstractly in that kind of way. Now I'm going to go back in and work the side of the eye socket. I had that plane a little bit too large and that happens. I tend to make my shapes a little bit more broad than need be and that's just the nature of working general to specific because I can come back in with a single brush stroke and correct it and now I'm going to paint in another plane. So this is a darker plane and it's facing the light even less than the surrounding areas. Notice I'm working from the darks to the lights. So my first statement was that that plane was dark and now I'm going to move my way back to the corner of the eyelid to follow through to try and get the fullness of that form. And I should note that I am standing back pretty much after every single brush stroke. I think it's important to stand back as much as you can because the painting can look one way to you six inches away but then six feet away it falls apart so the important thing is to always keep the big picture in mind especially when you're painting the small shapes in painting the small shapes it's important to always stand back and see what these shapes look like at a distance because that is really the most important viewpoint of your picture. It's how people will immediately recognize the image is from how it looks maybe six or ten feet away. And that's even what we see first when we walk around an art gallery or in a museum. We see first the big picture and then we walk closer to it to further examine it. So now I'm going to be painting uh, the other planes, the other smaller planes of the face. Notice the mouth isn't even in there yet. And I'm going to first carve a little bit on the outside of the face and then use the fan brush to try to eliminate the glare. And I do apologize for the glare. Some, with some paintings it just happens that I, I get more glare during the filming than other paintings. Not really sure why that is. I hope it's not because of the walnut oil that I was using. Uh, but I will figure that out later. But in any case, uh, I'm going to be now using a single brush stroke to try and figure out the placement of the mouth. I usually try to figure out the placement of the mouth using a single brush stroke like that one. And I think about the distance from the bottom of the nose to the top of the mouth. And you can also think about it as the length of the philtrum. The philtrum is that teardrop looking thing uh, that you can picture between the top of your upper lip and the bottom of your nose. That little teardrop looking thing is the philtrum. 
And so, in any case, that's that distance right here, and I'm trying to figure out what that distance is. I had it too high up first, so I lowered it a little bit, and now I think it's all right at the distance where it is now. And the reason being that I have started working with this area last. Notice I'm using a vertical to relate the corner of the mouth. The reason I've been painting uh, the mouths a little bit near the end of the uh, rendering cycle, that is rendering the eyes first, then the nose, then the mouth. The reason being is logistically it's a little easier to move a mouth than it is to move an eye. And it's easier to move a mouth than it is to move a nose. The eyes are something that are much more difficult to adjust. So I usually try to nail them as much as possible. So if you think of a, a gauge of my effort, most of my effort goes into trying to place the eyes in the relative correct location in relation to the large structure of the head. Then we have the nose and the mouth. And we should also keep track of our tendencies too. My tendency is usually to place the mouth too far down. That's my tendency, so I'm very cautious with that. And I know with this model, the mouth is fairly far down. So I want to make sure to gauge that distance as accurately as I possibly can. Now putting in a dark accent for the side of the mouth. For the mouth, it can really be that simple. It's just maybe three values that I added onto the mouth. And already it reads kind of as a mouth from maybe five feet away and that's what I want that's how I want it to work that the mouth reads its best from maybe four or five feet away and now I'm gonna go back in and start to add more of the structures around the muzzle of the mouth so the, the muzzle of the mouth is a conceptualized idea of that inner structure that encompasses the entire shape of the mouth. So that's what I'm painting now. Uh, putting in another plane to the bottom of the chin. I'm still very much painting plane by plane. So there is a plane with more light there. I'm going to move the corner of the mouth actually a little bit lower on that side. Now I'm going to paint in uh, too dark right there. I'm going to bring that value up a little bit. I, half tone right here to the corner of this structure of the face this little corner right here and now i'm going to go in and establish another lighter plane following through right here to the other side of the face so i like to work from one side of the face to the other side of the face trying to follow through and picture each structure uh, wrapping around the face and in this case this structure right here this light structure right here I'm trying to think of it as if the nose wasn't even there I'm trying to think of it as the large underlying plane that encompasses the features so now it's also a little bit darker as it rolls across closer to the mouth and this area here is also a little bit darker but not quite as dark so I'm raising up the value a little bit and there's also a change in the way that I'm applying the paint onto the surface now as I'm getting into these smaller shapes so I'm actually applying less pressure onto the surface yet still using a lot of paint there is actually a lot of paint on that little brush but I'm applying less pressure and now the mixtures aren't really that novel these mixtures of color are really just anything that was on my palette just trying to gauge the values more carefully uh, in some paintings uh, I push the color a little bit more uh, the color differences I push them a little bit more in some paintings in other paintings I let them be a little bit more neutral and subdued and this one is a little bit more neutral and subdued uh, the photo reference was actually taken uh, in my living room the window uh, that I was using I think that's an east facing window 
But in any case, my surroundings in the house are very gray, very subdued. So it's not the kind of light that I've painted before, or I took photographs in uh, north light where there was much more luminosity in the environment. In this case, the environment's much more kind of gray. So I don't really have too much uh, color variation. So I don't want to push the color variation too much. And so now I'm going to go in and establish this plane right here to the bottom of the chin. Now if you notice, I added the features now and a few more planes onto the face and the change is pretty huge from what existed before. Now before it was a big mess and seemingly almost hopeless, right? How could he possibly work with something that looked that horrendous? Well, in the beginning I really wanted to have something down first. I really wanted to have an idea of the big shapes in relation to one another, knowing I'd come back in with the smaller brushes as you saw me do before and add more of these planes onto the face. And that's what I did. And so now it looks a little bit more on a human scale. And I reiterate, I'm trying to use more paint than I had used in previous videos. Uh, though you haven't seen it, you can see kind of the battlefield on the palette, how much mixing went on and how much paint I actually used. Uh, actually almost running out of paint on my palette. I've used so much paint. And now a little quote from uh, Mr. John Singer Sargent. No small dabs of color. You want plenty of paint to paint with. And another quote of his is, the thicker you paint, the more it flows. And so what did that mean? I didn't understand that before. I had stated that quote uh, before in previous videos. Didn't quite understand it until I attempted to create a Rembrandt master copy and that was last week's video and in last week's video that was really kind of eye-opening to me uh, how much paint Rembrandt actually used in that famous self-portrait that he created and then it really got to me that the more paint that you use the more of a development of volume you can get through those gradations of value and now I'm gonna go in uh, with the dark red of the fabric, a little alizarin crimson, cadmium red, back to the alizarin crimson, neutralize it a little bit with the raw umber. Raw umber is a good color to try to neutralize the saturation of any kind of bright red and bring the value down a little bit. And so I'm going to go even further and put my cobalt teal into the mixture to try to neutralize that color a little more. And so now that I have it, I'm going to spread the entire tone onto the dark of the, the fabric that the model was wearing. And just a few little glimpses here and there of light and dark is all I really need. And now I'm going to put in some more light here onto the corner of the fabric. I don't actually see it like that on the photo reference, but I just like the way that looks. And so I'm just going to push it and create that. I'm going to put some little dabs of purple and pink onto the shirt. Again, I don't really see it too much like that, but that's just what I wanted to paint. And remember that your canvas, your panel, your drawing, your sculpture, what it is you're creating is your own world. And it's your own world that you're adding to the existing one that we're in. This world can be a pretty dark and negative place, but if we paint each individual picture with a motivated and curious brushstroke, then each and every picture that we create can bring that much more harmony to this world that we live in. So paint with positivity. Don't fill your brush just with paint, but fill it with hope. Allow each brush stroke to have a glimpse of the positivity within you. And then by the end of the picture, 
you would have made the world that much of a better place. And now I'm going to start to add in even more information onto the background. And I don't usually do that with my painting demonstrations, usually because I don't really have the time uh, to paint them. With, but with this one, I decided to take that risk. And so initially I knew that I was going to put more information into the background. So that's why I was very, uh, I was thinking very much more of the placement of the head. Remember in the beginning I kind of shifted it a little bit, maybe in the first minute or so, and pushed the green of the background intentionally because I knew I would put in that dark red for the fabric. And now I also see a kind of rectangular piece of this composition. That rectangular piece is the glimpse of that large window that's providing the light and so that's what I'm going to do with that little uh, brush stroke right here just paint in that large and cool value and now I'm going to contrast it with the surrounding colors of the background so now what I'm going to do is first sharpen that edge to create that rectangle and then you're going to see the rest of the picture uh, the rest of the background color filled in so now that the rest of the background color is filled in, I now have the compositional elements that I wanted for the rest of the big picture. Now I'm going to go back in to the forms on the face. And uh, I think it's important to work various areas of the picture. Working on the background actually helped me realize that I'm missing uh, some structure on the side of the model's face. And like I said before, it's not really it's never going to be perfect, but with each and every painting, you're going to make yourself that much of a stronger painter. And so now I'm going in, still painting plane by plane, but in this case, each brush stroke is being placed in to be the final brush stroke on this section of the face. Like I did with the eyes, I'm going in and thinking of each individual plane as having a specific angle in relation to the light. And now I'm going to soften this edge here uh, with a, a dry sable brush, just a cheap synthetic sable brush. I honestly don't even know where I got that brush. I think I've just had that brush for years. So I just use it to uh, soften some of the edges. Now here's another plane curving away from the light, darker than the plane surrounding it onto the top. Now I'm going to follow through and try to paint in another plane directly below it facing the light even less but very slightly less and I'm thinking of the edge quality as well so there is a ton of paint on the surface but now at this stage I'm really trying to make sure that each individual edge is also being accounted for so I want these edges on the corner of the face to be uh, very defined. I want these forms to be very defined, but then coming in with this, uh, this smooth uh, sable brush, try to soften the edge just a little bit, just a little touch to try to simplify that edge. And so now we're going to move back into the background, and now I'm going to fill in uh, more color onto the red that the model's wearing. I usually leave a vignette kind of with my uh, painting videos. A vignette is an area of the painting that's unfinished but still kind of thought out compositionally. Uh, I was going to leave a vignette but then I figured I'm going to cover the background even more. There's even some uh, plants in the background and I'm going to incorporate that actually into the picture and again, this is uh, actually new for my painting videos. I don't think I've ever put this much time into the background before. Usually it's pretty much just a head in space, but in this case, I'm trying to actually incorporate the dark values of the background and think about the colors of the background in relation to one another. And so now I realized here in the corner of the model shirt, I was missing a shadow, so I placed in just a little brush stroke of blue there. Again, not really how I see it, but kind of how I envision it, so that's how I painted it. Now going back in with the red, 
actually going to push the red a little bit more. So I added some more of the cadmium red, neutralized it a little bit uh, with the ultramarine blue. And now I'm going in and filling in the rest of this area with this dark mass of paint. And also adding more elements to the picture to surround the face is actually something that can help build the narrative along with the composition of the picture. And uh, it's kind of like, you can picture it however you want, but it's kind of like she's sitting in a corner in an interior of a house or something, kind of looking out into the light, almost anxiously but calmly, kind of waiting for someone. Or maybe she's sitting there and she's waiting for something. Uh, maybe a package in the mail, or maybe for her husband to come home, or maybe she's just looking out into the window and just meditating. It's any kind of narrative you can think of. And that's kind of something that's pretty fun to do with a painting. And remember how I said kind of filling your brush with positivity? And that's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to paint it as a kind of dark, somber kind of experience, but rather I'm painting it kind of uh, freely, letting lots of the brush strokes in the background show, almost kind of like childish, but that's just the way that I like the background to look, kind of more of a sketched out, more of a, a fresh, loose kind of development. And you see that a lot in, in many painting. You see that a lot in John Singer Sargent paintings, a lot of Rembrandt paintings, not so much in Vermeer paintings, but in any case I like the way that the background elements kind of adds to the narrative of the picture that she's looking out into the window and waiting for something to appear. But in any case, I put in another dark light there for the corner of the side of the model's shoulder I'm going to try and soften it a little bit. That brush didn't really help soften it, so I'm going to go in with this one right here, uh, this larger fan brush to try and soften that edge, just so the uh, red fabric can have more of a volume to it uh, by having it get darker as it turns away from the light. And now I'm going to fill in uh, this background, or this back color of the model's neck. I I noticed that the shape was a little bit off, so I'm gonna, I went back in and added a darker value and then uh, used my fan brush to try to eliminate that uh, glare that it had. And now I'm going in with a very cheap synthetic brush. Uh, this is actually a brush that I had, but I don't like to use. But in this case, I'm going to use it because it's a very soft brush. And so using it loaded with ivory black, alizarin crimson, and a little bit of ultramarine blue, I'm going back in and adding more depth into the dark mass of the hair. Remember I said before that the dark values or the dark applications of paint would settle in after time, and so that's kind of what happened. They settled in, so that allowed me to come back in with a loaded brush and add even more of a darker accent and creating more of a depth of field into the values. And still, remember, it's not straight ivory black. There's still some more uh, color that went into that dark value. Now I'm going to go back in with the background brush and try to, again, reiterate that shape, adding more and more color uh, to the background. Now just trying to carve the, uh, the back of the model's hair using the fan brush also helps me to soften that edge just a little bit. And I'm also going to intentionally kind of make some of these brush strokes show. And I'm going to do that just by kind of scrubbing the background a little bit. So I'm just going to scrub it a tad bit on this corner right here. And now I'm going to go back in with the fan brush and eliminate the glare that I created by scrubbing that onto the surface. But that helped me create a little bit more of a kind of atmosphere in the background as opposed to it being completely flat. And now I'm going to add a little bit more of a dark to the bottom 
of the, the models, again trying to increase the depth of field. So by modulating the values to be a little bit darker, a little bit behind her, also adds kind of an air or some kind of atmosphere to the surface. Now going back in uh, with a mixture of this sap green and the ultramarine blue, I'm going to start to add in the little hints in there of the uh, plants in the background and I'm gonna play a 2D 3D kind of game actually uh, meaning I'm gonna make the plants appear a little bit more two-dimensional than the uh, than the face and this is another kind of compositional trick where you can make something two-dimensional looking and that only then can bring out the contrast between the two-dimensionality of the object in the background in comparison to the three-dimensionality of the object in the foreground. And so that kind of compositional uh, trickery, if you will, actually can add to the three-dimensionality of the portrait. So now I'm going to go back in with the sap green and the ivory black and a little bit of cobalt teal. And I'm going to try to add a little bit more of uh, a glimpse of a little leaf here. Notice I'm kind of spinning the brush as I release it from the surface to get more of a pointy kind of tip to the the plant in the background and I'm also adding more leaves. There's a plant. Again, the picture is yours. You can do with it what you want to do with it. Create with it what you want to create with it. It's really your picture, your imagination, it's your touch that you're applying to the painting. And for me, I just wanted to exaggerate the plant. So I started adding little things here and there, like little uh, little nubs or little branches that don't have anything on them. I kind of push them a little bit more than they are seen in the photo reference. And I'm going to add another one right here another little plant right there, just a little glimpse of a plant uh, behind her to the left. Again fanning it out with the fan brush and I think I'm even going to add some of the light onto the plant that is closest to the window. So let's go ahead and switch brushes now to this uh, kind of cheap synthetic one with the cadmium yellow, the sap green, on top of the flesh tones that already existed on the palette, I did that intentionally to bring down the saturation of the green. And so now I'm going to put in just a little glimpse of light there. Just a little glimpse of light here for the plant. Don't really want to show too much of the plant. I still want to keep it kind of two dimensional to try to add just another compositional element to the picture. Just a little glimpse of light onto the plant. As I add more information into the background, I'm also going to talk a little bit uh, about the art of painting and what it does uh, to one another and what it can do for others. So what it does for the painter, oftentimes it's a very fun uh, liberating kind of experience where we're kind of playing with these colors and creating any kind of design that we want but then there can also be challenges and drawing composition value color anatomy where we really want to get specific with things and then we end up loving the painting as much as we hate it and that's kind of always going to be like that. It's kind of a love and hate kind of relationship with painting where we really like our painting and at the same time we really hate it. And I think it's it's something we can work through that part of painting where we don't like what we're doing. And I think it's important to uh, realize that there's not just one way to do something. There's more than just one way to create an image. I could have easily done an underpainting and then glazed over this and still achieved a similar result. Uh, but instead I chose to go in more directly. 
I think it's important to familiarize yourself with the brush. Familiarize yourself with the pigment and with the paint. And throughout your experiences, you will develop and you will learn which methods you like to use, which methods work for you, which methods don't work for you. But I think it's important to continue to develop your craft, to continue to get a familiarity with with painting. And in that sense, you will learn. And that's the way the learning process kind of works with painting. The more we work at it, the more we progress. And it's a very at least for me, I'm speaking from my own experience, a very slow progression. It takes time for me to learn something new. I'm very happy with sacrificing any one painting for the sake of learning something new. And that's kind of been my thought process uh, throughout my, uh, my years in painting, is that I would rather learn something from this than try to spend all my efforts trying to create a satisfying image. And with that being said, that is the end to this week's portrait painting demonstration. Thank you so much for watching. I hope it helps you out. And as always, I hope you stay tuned for next week's video. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you next time.